Well, this morning, as I've told you, we are looking at the topic, why is it that we should glorify God? You know, the last sola, sola dea gloria, to God alone be the glory. That means a couple of things. It means that we should give God all the glory for, and by the way, by glory, that means honor. We give him the credit, okay? He did it, so we acknowledge he did it, and we thank him for, for that. And we thank him for specifically the work of salvation, that he saved us from our sins. Uh, we would have perished without his intervention, by his Son and by his Holy Spirit. But we also should honor him for everything, because everything we have comes from him, our existence, this world, everything in it, all the good gifts. It all comes from him. And when we are enabled to do anything that's praiseworthy, that came from him as well. And so we need to give him glory. Now, we're not going to be able to look at all of those things. We do want to focus on the fact, though, that we should honor the Lord and give him the credit for every single thing, every single good thing that happens, particularly salvation. And we see that in our text this morning, which is the one verse uh, at the end of Romans chapter 11, where Paul says this, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Now, we're going to come back to that and unpack it, but first I just wanted to review a little bit of what we've seen because we are moving up now to a climax in these five solos. Remember, we've been looking at the five solos of the Reformation over this past, the past month and even the last week, I think, in September. So we moved into October, and now this first week in, in November. And we've seen so far basically these things that when it comes, first of all, to our ultimate standard, uh, what we are to trust to show us ultimate truth, who God is and who we are, what it is He's done to save us and how He wants us to live. That that standard must be the one that God gives to us. You know, I can't emphasize that enough. This was emphasized over and over during the time of the Reformation. The Bible is the authority. We need to listen to what God says here. It's not what the church says, unless what the church says agrees with the Bible. It's not what our friends think, unless what they think agrees with the Bible. It's not even what we think, unless our thoughts are informed by the Scriptures. It's what God says in His Word, which is the Bible, the 66 books of the Old and the New Testament. Now, we've seen that with regard to our salvation, with regard to our justification, God has some very specific things to say about that in His Word. First of all, He tells us that we cannot earn salvation because everything we do falls short. We're born in sin and we don't have any love in our hearts for God. We cannot do anything good. Paul looked at his works as a Pharisee when he came to Christ and he said, everything that I've done is a giant hill or mound of refuse or dung. That's what our works are in the sight of God. We need something better. So we can't earn it, and the Bible tells us we also can't work for it. How can you work for it if all you can do is things that are offensive to God? God had to provide for it graciously, and that is exactly what He did. He provided through His Son, and He offers it freely to whoever wants it. He offers it as a free gift. We simply need to receive salvation. We don't work for it. We receive it. Now, the only, we've seen the only way that we can receive it is by looking to the one, the only one that God has provided who can stand between Him and us and bring us together. And that one person, that one mediator is the Lord Jesus. And the reason why there's only one is because Jesus alone has done what needed to be done in order to bring about this reconciliation, in order to save us. He is the only one who did what God commands, the one who loved his father and who loved his neighbor perfectly. He's the only one. He's the only one who has suffered and died, not only that we might live by trusting in Him, but that we might live the kind of life that He calls us to live. And what I've just done is summarize the first four solas. Scripture alone is our authority. 
God is the one who graciously provides salvation. It's received by faith alone. And Jesus is the one, the only mediator that God has given to reconcile us to him. Now, this morning, we come to the last solo, which tells us why it's important that we understand and accept the other four solas. It's important, first of all, because if we don't choose to come to God the way that God has provided, we won't be saved. There's only one way, only one mediator, and this is the way, by grace through faith alone, in the Lord Jesus Christ. If we don't come to God in this way, we will have to pay for our own sins. We will have to pay the very just penalty God will inflict upon us, actually the Lord Jesus, on the day of judgment, which is an eternity in a fiery hell. That's the reason why Jesus came into the world, why the great price was paid, which is what the Lord's table reminds us of this morning, why the Son of God had to give his life in order to free us from uh, our, well, our, our debt to justice because it was so great and that great debt that we owe will not be satisfied even through an eternity of suffering. That's why the one who would pay for our sins had to be God and man. So it's important that we believe these things because this is the only way we can come to God. But it's important, secondly, because we need to give credit where credit is due. If God alone is the one who saves us, if this is something that the three persons of the Godhead have done by themselves, then God alone should receive the credit for it. Now, if we needed anyone else besides the Lord Jesus Christ, in addition to the Lord Jesus Christ, to save us, then part of the honor would go to that person. This is the reason why the Roman scheme is, is wrong. If we needed Rome and we needed her priest to give us the grace that they supposedly give us through the sacraments, if we needed the forgiveness that they grant to us through absolution, then they would deserve part of that honor. It's not just God, but it's mediated through the church. Jesus isn't then the only mediator, but the church is mediating. No, it's Jesus Christ alone. The work is done by God alone. We don't need Rome and her mediators. If we needed our good works, if we had to add our works to the equation, even after having come to the Lord Jesus, if we had to overcome all of our sins, if we had to become perfectly obedient in absolutely everything, even with the help Jesus gives us, before God would accept us, you know, Jesus plus our works, then we would deserve part of that honor. If we needed Mary and the saints to pray for us, to help make us acceptable to God, if we needed their merits, their excess merits stored in the treasury of merits and meted out to us through the church, then they too would deserve part of that honor. If we even had a choice whether or not to exercise a, a faith, a faith that we're all capable of exercising without God's help, without His grace, without His Holy Spirit, as the majority of evangelical Christians believe today, then we would deserve part of the honor for having the good sense to exercise that faith and to trust in Jesus. I mean, if it's within everybody's grasp and it basically boils down to you, you would get part of the credit for doing what should be done, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, see, the whole point of this sola is essentially this. We don't deserve any of the honor. Neither does the church, neither do the saints. Only God deserves this glory because we have done nothing. He has done it all. And that's what sola dea gloria is all about. To God alone belongs the glory. Not surprisingly, that's what Paul tells us in our passage this morning. He says again in, in chapter 11, verse 36, For from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. Now, Paul says, first of all, in, in the last part of this verse, he says this, To him, that is to God, because that's who the him is in the context, be the glory that is the credit, the honor, and I think implied all the glory forever. He deserves it all. But then we need to ask the question, what is Paul talking about here? 
What does he have in mind? Well, in order to understand that, we back up to the previous sentence, and he tells us, for all things. Okay? Now, this all things could be taken absolutely, right? Because everything good, everything praiseworthy comes from God. James reminds us in James 1 verse 17, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. God deserves the glory for all things, absolutely all things. Why? Well, because He's the one who created all things. First of all, He made the heavens, the place where He dwells in all of His glory and where He reveals His glory, where the angels also, whom He created, live, whom He's made, to minister to us, to serve us. God deserves glory for that. He deserves glory for making the world. And when the Bible talks about the world, it's talking about not just the earth, but the sun, the moon, the stars, the universe, the galaxies. He made this world or this earth, its mountains, its skies, and its seas, and he filled it with all of these creatures, many of which we enjoy. I mean, do you have a, a pet? Those things also came from God, and we should give him glory for those things, the credit for that. We should give him the credit for making us. He made us special. He made us in his image so that we might think his thoughts after him, that we might know him, that we might worship him. Now, God made all of these things in order that he might show us who he is, uh, something of what he's like, how powerful he is, how wise he is. Uh, especially see that, of course, in, in the power that must have been necessary to create and organize the entire universe. We see his power and his wisdom, but we also see his mercy and his goodness in the things that he has made in this world, the things he has given to us, the families, children, uh, food and clothing, everything we need to survive. But he also deserves honor because even when we in Adam fell away from him, you know, sinned against him and became his enemies, God continued to show us mercy. He continued to show his kindness to us. Remember what Jesus says in Luke 6, verse 35. He says, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. You see, that's what we were when we came into the world. We were ungrateful and we were evil, and God was kind to us. He was very kind to us because he not only provided for us, but he also brought Jesus into the world and he brought that message of what Jesus did to us. Now, Paul says in, again, Romans 11, verse 36, from him... And through him and to him are all these things. And what he means by that is simply this. God is the source. That's what it means is from him, out of him. He is the source of all things. He is the creative agent. Through him all these things were done. And he is the reason that he has done all these things. To him are all these things. And he, he, the reason he did these things was to display his glory. He wanted to show us what he was like so we could see it and we could marvel and worship him for these things. But <clears throat> that for which God should be most honored is the work of salvation. And I believe that's what Paul is talking about in our passage. Salvation, this work of salvation, everything that's involved in it comes from him. He is the source. It all comes from his love and it comes from his mercy. It comes from his plan to save a people from his desire to display his grace and to honor his son. That is how God is the source of, of this salvation. He is the one who carried it out. He is the active agent in the work of redemption. Salvation is through him, by means of him. That's, you know, by his agency, I think, is the, the more appropriate way of saying it. The triune God is involved in our salvation. He's the one who worked it out, uh, the three persons. The Father is the one who sent his Son into the world, who gave that which is most precious to him, that the Son might become one with us, be born into our race, that he might obey and die in our place, that he might love his Father and love his neighbor, 
and that, you know, and that in our place for us, and that he might die on the cross with our sins upon him so that he might fully pay for them. The son came in obedience to his father by submitting to becoming a man, by obeying, by dying, by being raised and glorified for us. The Spirit came in obedience to the Father and the Son, and as we've seen, He applied Jesus to us, plugged us into Jesus, into His life, raised us from the dead, made us alive when we were dead. He made us alive, remember? That wasn't something we did, that was something He did. And in raising us to life, He gave us the ability to believe, and when we believed, we were united to Jesus in a legal way, so that what Jesus did... The Father now looks at us and says, you've done that because you are in Jesus. So the Father paid the price. Jesus was the price paid. And the Holy Spirit was what was purchased by that price, that he might be joined to us and by doing so, join us to Jesus in order that we might be saved. Salvation is entirely from God. We contributed Exactly nothing to it. In Romans 11.35, Paul writes this, Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? God is not paying us with salvation because we have worked for him. It's entirely a free gift. We haven't given anything to him. And he gives us everything. And the reason why he did all of these things, and this is a blow to our pride as human beings, he didn't do it because... He loved us so much he had to do it. He didn't, you know, the whole purpose of of redemption and salvation wasn't just to save us. We were not the primary goal in salvation or the end that he was after. He was the goal. He did these things for himself. Salvation is to him. It has reference to him. It's the reason why he does what he does. The work of salvation was to show us something about himself. It was to show us his love and his mercy. God wanted to display that to us, and he did very powerfully in his son. He allowed the fall to take place, that he might send his son into the world, that his son might save us, and the spirit might quicken us, so that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit might be glorified. That's the end goal, their glory. The fact is, we happen to benefit from his desire to glorify himself. We need to be thankful he is the God that he is because of what he, you know, what he has revealed is this great love and we have, again, been blessed by it. And the way that he saved us was also to show us his wisdom. I mean, who would have thought that the way to bring the world to Christ would be by his own people rejecting him and then turning to the Gentiles while he's hardening them in order to bring, uh, again, many people to Christ. He sent his son to a people that he knew would reject him. He knew some would believe because he chose to have mercy on some, but he knew he chose not to have mercy on most of them. He knew they would reject him. They knew, he knew, they would crucify him. Then he turned to the Gentiles, as we saw, to provoke the Jews to jealousy in order that they might turn to him. And this is the process by which he will bring all his people to himself. Now again, the reason why he did it this way was that he might glorify his wisdom. Think about what Paul says in verse 35 of Romans 11 as he thinks about all the things that God has just done and how he's explained it to us, what he has done. He says this, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. Who would have thought? But God in his wisdom used the sins of his people. He used the wickedness and the evil. He used everything in order to bring about our salvation. Again, the point is, to God alone belongs the glory. Now, that explains what this passage means. But this passage actually calls us now to do two things in particular. First of all, we need to make sure that we give God his due, right? All the glory, all the credit, all the honor for our salvation belongs to him. You know, last week we sung a, a hymn by Top Lady. And uh, Augustus Top Lady was, um, if we know church history a bit, 
He, he was a reformed minister, and he lived during the time of John Wesley, and John Wesley was not reformed. We believe that John Wesley was a believer, and he was used by the Lord to bring many people to Christ because he was preaching the gospel. And Charles Wesley wrote many of the hymns that we sing that we love the most, right? But Augustus Toplady, as he considered what John Wesley believed, um, he was a bit incensed by that and jealous for God's honor because he saw that John Wesley was actually robbing God of some of his glory. And the way he was doing it is John Wesley believes that, yes, everybody comes into the world dead in sin, cannot believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but God intervenes and he gives to the entire world uh, grace. He gives them enough grace to believe. And then he leaves it in our court, are you going to believe or not? And Augustus Toplady was saying, he doesn't, he doesn't do that. He doesn't leave it in our court. We do nothing. We don't even contribute the act of faith. That's something that God gives to us sovereignly. It's from first to last of him. And if you give man that much of the credit, you are robbing God of his glory. So he writes in his hymn, how vast the benefits divine, these words, the glory, Lord, from first to last is due to thee alone, ought to ourselves we dare not take or rob thee of thy crown. Now what Augustus Top Lady was saying this, every time we begin to think that we have something to do with our salvation, where uh, we not only rob God of his glory, if we really believe this, by the way, we won't believe this if we really belong to him, we will give him all the glory. But Paul goes even a little bit further to say that we have actually fallen from grace. That's the danger here. Because if it's by grace, it can't be by works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. And Paul reminds us over and over again in the book of Romans and the book of Galatians, if we add even an iota of our own works and we trust that Jesus plus this thing, then we have lost everything. We have fallen from grace. Remember what um, the Judaizers believed. They believed that if a Jew who was one of God's covenant people or a Gentile was to be saved, they not only had to believe in Jesus, but they had to be circumcised. And they had to obey the law of Moses. Now, what did Paul have to say about that? Listen to, carefully to his words here in Galatians 5, verses 1 through 4. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you, and he's talking now here to a group of people, the Galatian church who have received the Lord Jesus Christ but have been infiltrated by these Judaizers who came from the Jerusalem church and had not fully accepted Christ but believed you needed a blend of both. He says this, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision... Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Those are pretty serious words. I don't know if they, if they really register in our minds what he's saying here. But now he's not saying just if you get circumcised. Because there was one occasion where Paul took Timothy and had him circumcised because his mother was Jewish and his father was a Greek and wherever he went, he wanted to make sure the Jews knew that Timothy was walking according to the traditions just as Paul was. That's not what he's talking about here. He's saying if you think that you need Jesus and you need to be circumcised to be saved, then you have fallen from grace because you've added a work to that grace. It's not just the circumcision, but it's trusting the circumcision to save you, to add to the righteousness of Christ that he's given to you freely. To add circumcision or to add anything to Jesus is to lose everything, is what he's saying. Now again, I don't believe any true believer will ever do that, even if we get mixed up in our minds. But we need to get the principle straight. We don't add anything to what Jesus has done. So again, looking at the Reformation, what if we add the Roman priests and the sacraments and their absolution, the prayers of Mary and the saints, their merits from the treasury of merits. What if we add our works of sanctification, our struggles to become perfect in order to become acceptable to God? What if we look to our faith 
as, as an act or a work that we do that God counts as our righteousness, that our faith in this sense saves us because we did something that is so meritorious in the eyes of God, He basically he, well, chose to reward us with salvation. You see, if we do any of these things, and this was the whole point of the Reformation, we're doing the same things that the Galatians did, and we're falling under the same judgment. We need to give God all the credit alone by looking to Jesus alone as our only hope of salvation. He alone has done it. He alone deserves the glory. Now, that's the first thing we learn from this passage. The second thing we need to do or this passage calls us to do, is in giving God glory to live for His glory alone. We do need to ask the question, why did God make us? Why did He send His Son for us? Why did He give us His Holy Spirit? Well, tonight, Dr. Nichols, in our lecture, is going to point out a number of catechisms that were written in order to answer this question. It's, it's generally the first question asked in the catechism and as he's pointing them out, one of the ones he's going to draw attention to is the one that, that we use in our church, which is called the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Of course, we have a larger one, too, and we have the Confession. But this is the one where I think we're more familiar with. The first question is this. What is the chief end of man? And is, why did God make us? Well, the answer is, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Now, the main reason God made us was to give Him glory, that we might enjoy Him. When we give God glory, we enjoy Him. Now, that's why He made us, but when He made us, we know that in Adam, uh, we fell away from God, making it impossible for us to do this. And so God sent His Son into the world so that we could. That's what the work of redemption is all about. And now that we can again do this, God calls us to give Him glory in all things. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10.31, Whether then you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything we should be doing, we're doing for the glory of God. And remember this, that when God calls us to give Him glory, He's not calling us, as it were, to glorify Him for nothing. Okay? When we live the way He calls us to live, when we glorify Him by, by serving Him and particularly by pointing others to Him, remember we are the ambassadors He's given to the world, we are the light of the world, we experience a kind of pleasure and joy that we won't experience any other way. The, the greatest pleasures that the world has to give will, won't come anywhere near to this kind of pleasure that the Lord gives to us. Now, we know that sin, uh, as we read, in, I believe, in the book of Hebrews, is fun for a little while, but eventually it brings misery in this life and the one to come. There are consequences. When we step out of God's will, there's always going to be consequences. We might think it's good, we might think it's fun, but eventually it, it isn't, and particularly in eternity. But godliness, which is giving glory to God, will bring us pleasure in this life. There's one occasion where, where Jesus is thinking about the work of His Father and how he, he hid basically the work of salvation from the wise and the noble and He revealed it to the infants or the babes, in, those that aren't so wise, those who aren't so knowledgeable. And when Jesus was thinking about it, He rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. He experienced a kind of pleasure and joy in His Father's work that, that was beyond anything that anyone might experience in this world, anything that was possible for man to have because he was glorifying his father and his father was, was giving him this experience of pleasure and joy. And this is something that we can experience too, that we can enjoy too, but we will only experience it if we devote our lives to him. So glorifying God will bring uh, an enjoyment of God in this life and it will also bring an enjoyment in the life that is to come, the one that stretches endlessly before us in heaven with Him. In that place, we will be perfectly filled 
with the Holy Spirit and the joy and the happiness of God. So when we ask the question, why should we glorify God? There's a few answers to it. We should because He deserves it. Because He's the one who's done everything. Uh, He made us and He saved us. And because this is the only way that we will find our true happiness is by giving glory to God. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That's why God made us. And if we are to fulfill that purpose, we must trust in Jesus alone. And again, that's what the table reminds us of this morning. So let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us uh, receive this and understand it, accept it, apply it. And let's also at the same time uh, ask him to prepare us to come to the table, uh, to remember what Jesus has done and to receive, uh, again, more grace, greater grace of the Holy Spirit that we might enjoy him even more.